Hello. Hello, everyone. Hi, everyone. Wonderful. Um, I think we are. I think we're going to make a start. Um, um, looks like we have everyone here, which is great. Well, welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Ben Dibbling. I'm the Managing Director of the Penn Centre for Innovation. Um, for those of you that don't know, uh, the Penn, at the Penn Centre for, Inno for Innovation, our team's focused on identifying and implementing relationships with the commercial sector to facilitate the development of new products and services based on invention, uh, inventions and discoveries generated by Penn's outstanding faculty and research scientists. And whether the end result is a new venture, a corporate alliance, a licensing agreement or sponsored research, PCI serves as a one-stop shop for industry to engage with Penn. Uh, PCI had another record-breaking year for commercialization activities in fiscal year 23, again across multiple research sectors. And I'd encourage you all to check out uh, PCI's year in re review, uh, which is available on our website. And it's perhaps unfair to focus on any individual metric, uh, but it's worth highlighting that uh, despite what's been a very tough market for uh, startup companies, Penn affiliated companies raised over $1 billion in new investment capital, which is a record for Penn this last fiscal year. And for the second year in a row, uh, Penn ranked number one among, amongst its peer institutions in terms of licensing income received. Um, and it's really a pleasure to be here today. And I'm honored to have the opportunity to welcome so many alumni, colleagues, collaborators, and friends of Penn uh, to what is our eighth, Laurie? Eighth annual Innovation at Penn event at the JP Morgan Healthcare Investor Conference here at Wharton, San Francisco. Uh, I'm joined here today by multiple colleagues from the Penn Center for Innovation. Uh, Laurie Ackman, who's PCI's Chief Marketing, Communications and Programs Officer, and Sam Savello from her team. Uh, Carter Caldwell, who directs Penn Medicine's co-investment program. Uh, Michael Poizel, who's the Executive Director of PCI Ventures, and is here with Bhavana Mahanrav, uh, Mahanraj from his team, and Jim Bowen, who we'll be talking about in a moment. And we've got a really great panel here today. And at PCI, I, I'll be honest, it's sometimes tough to pick a topic each year based on the quality of researchers that we have at the institution, many of whom are working on cutting edge technologies directly related to med tech and the biopharmaceutical industry. And today's topic, the future of neuroscience innovation is no exception. And I think you're in for a real treat here uh, with this group of esteemed faculty uh, representing multiple schools at Penn. And our moderator today um, is actually a colleague of mine, uh, Dr. Jim Bowen. Uh, Jim's PCI's Executive Director of Corporate Alliances. Uh, Jim's been with PCI since about 2008, and he leads the Corporate Alliances team in the identification, negotiation, execution, and management of various innovative alliances that Penn has with both the commercial and non-for-profit sector. Um, the output of Jim's team has been truly impressive uh, over the years, irrespective of how you want to quantify it. But it's resulted in significant funding coming into Penn, both to support basic research and clinical research, uh, substantial licensing income, and the spinning out of multiple ventures. Um, and those programs have also resulted in the development of several significant commercial products, uh, along with many others that are currently in clinical development. And I'll finish by saying um, what I said last year, which is that a really big thank you to the law firm of Sal Ewing, who sponsors the event today, uh, but also thank them as well for the world, the, really the world-class service that they provide to PCI in securing intellectual property protection for Penn's groundbreaking innovations. And with that said, I will hand over the mic to Jim. All right. And... Uh... Well, welcome everyone. This is a remarkable turnout. Every year, it seems like our, our audience grows. So again, thank you all for 
being here. And uh, we hope as, as part of this panel, again, our, our goal is really to uh, convey and impart some knowledge about what the state of affairs is currently with, with neuroscience at Penn. What, what, what are the, some of the latest technology developments, the trends in, in neuroscience uh, research and neurotechnology coming out of the university? But also, where is this technology headed? What are some of the challenges that lie ahead? But what are some of the opportunities uh, again that we can we can ultimately uh, see evolve over the over the coming decade? Uh, so, a few ground rules before we get started. I, I, I would really appreciate it if everyone mutes their phones, shuts down devices as much as possible, and engages with the panel. And, and again, in, in in that regard, again, I, I'd like everyone to start thinking about questions. We're going to have a Q and A session toward the end of the panel. So, and each of you has a microphone uh, positioned around the table. So again, we'll, we'll save time at the end of the session for uh, Q&A and, and really uh, do, do value and, and, and look forward to, again, your, your questions about uh, to our esteemed panel. Uh, so, and before I, I get things kicked off with the panel, uh, my colleague Carter Caldwell uh, is, is really, uh, uh, he, he's, uh, a testament to, to you know the power of Penn Medicine. He 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 really uh, has has to Penn Medicine and, and neurotechnology has really transformed his life. And I I think uh, you know again no, there's no one better to speak to the 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 power of Penn uh, than, than Carter. And uh, you know, he's a few words he'd like to to say before we get started. You're very kind. Thank you, Jim. Um, I'm here just to provide a personal touch to the importance of neuroscience by sharing that I developed epilepsy as an adult and ultimately became a prisoner to constant seizures and forced me to adapt. Couldn't drive, constantly falling. And ultimately I landed as a neurology patient at Penn in 2006, where I put my hands in neuroscience. So previous doctors, couldn't figure out what was causing the seizures. Medicine wasn't controlling them. So I participated in a study that Penn was leading that used increasingly strong uh, imaging and utilized one of only 170 MRI machines in the world. And that ultimately led us to what we thought was the suspect. So then moving on to further advancements in neuroscience at Penn, using a cutting edge surgical approach in 2015, that used live imaging during the surgery, Penn neurosurgeons removed the right temporal lobe, which included a DNET, a slow-growing benign tumor. And that ultimately was the culprit of the seizures. So as a result of Penn's leadership in the field of neuroscience and folks like the people up here on this stage right now, I can say that I am so fortunate to be eight years seizure-free at this point. So when I joined Penn as an employee in a role where I can help the same faculty members who helped me get through this journey, it really goes to the advancement of science and especially me. So thank you all very, very much. So uh, with that, I'd like to uh, start with the introductions of the panel. And uh, I'd like each of the panelists to, to just briefly introduce uh, themselves and and provide uh, just a snapshot of, of current exciting neurotechnology uh, that, or te technology you're excited about that you're working on in your lab uh, that kind of highlights, uh, again, your, your current focus in, in neurotechnology development. So start with Mike Kahana. Hello, everybody. It's great to be here. Thanks, uh, Jim, for uh, uh, organizing this uh, panel. Um, I don't usually have this many students in my classes <laughs> at Penn. Uh, I, I, uh, is, this is really stunning. Uh, I teach uh, human memory and I teach the electrophysiology of human memory. So I teach a basic human memory course and then an advanced course on um, electrophysiology and data science as it applies to human memory. Um, I think maybe you didn't read the course reviews about all the equations and uh, uh, programming uh, data analysis uh, uh, assignments that I give. Uh, I've been teaching the subject of memory for 30 years now. This would be my 30th year. That's just starting. Um, and that's what I'm passionate about. How does human memory work? Why is it that um, 
you are sometimes able to remember something that you thought you had completely forgotten, uh, like a interaction that I had with, uh, is it Andrew Rosenthal, uh, 20 years ago? Hey, Andrew. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I saw when I, when I met him, when he first emailed me, when you first emailed me, Andrew, I'm like, who is that guy who's emailing me? And then I saw him and I remembered a almost movie-like image of an interaction that we had in uh, 20 years ago, 19 years ago. Um, and why is it that sometimes something that happened that was so important, we, we can't access at that moment? Why, why is it that we're frustrated that we can't remember something? And um, memory is this magical thing, both when it works, when it doesn't work, uh, to understand why it doesn't work. So that's, that's what I study. Um, and uh, I'll just say one more quick uh, uh, bit of background about me. So I got into the study of memory initially from um, an interest in neural network theory and the physics of neural networks. Uh, as an undergraduate, I was exposed as a, um, to the work of John Hopfield on um, attractor networks. And that led me to the study of memory, but I had no interest at all in the brain until a chance meeting with a neurosurgeon who works on epilepsy, uh, Joe Madsen in Boston at Boston Children's Hospital, um, exposed me to uh, the, the space of um, the treatment um, of individuals who have neurological disease or disorders. And that led me to do intracranial electrophysiology. Uh, I did some of that work with Brian back years ago. Um, and, uh, and now to the world of devices, where I work on building devices to restore memory in individuals with memory loss. And currently the device that uh, is based on the research that we've done in my lab is being uh, uh, tested on, uh, on sheep in Minneapolis and making sure that it functions the way it's supposed to. Um, and that, that's it. Thank you. Hey, Anna? Yeah, I can go next. So uh, my name is Anna Wexler. I'm an assistant professor of medical ethics and health policy at Penn. I'm sort of the odd person out, the odd woman out here because I'm the ethicist uh, on the panel. Um, but my, so my work focuses on ethical, legal, and social implications of emerging health technologies. I am what's called a neuroethicist. So uh, that means, you know, I think about ethics in relation to neuroscience and neuroscience developments. I do that pretty much most of my day, every day, is what, that's what I think about. Um, and so the kinds of work that I do, I think in the realm of neuroethics falls into at least two different buckets. Um, so one is thinking about research ethics. So working with researchers to help them think about the ethics and their study design. So how can we create better informed consent? What are the ethical issues in actually running uh, the study and how can we enhance the ethics of that study? Um, but I also think about the downstream implications, right? So uh, we're going to be hearing today about different technologies, um, new technologies that that are you know represent new ways of uh, peering into the mind, right? Understanding brain function, um, but also modulating or manipulating it. And so, as you can imagine, right? We're, you know, most of these technologies are developed in the health or medical sector, but there could be you know downstream implications that are not health related to those technologies. So a lot of what I do is thinking about the ethics of those downstream implications. Um, and the thing that I'm excited about, one of the most exciting things that I, I'm working on now um, is related to the fact that, you know, ethicists, traditionally the way we've communicated with the public or communicated with scientists is to publish these sort of dry journal articles or papers uh, or guidelines. I'm an author on, you know, a number of neuroethics guidelines, um, but I've been frustrated um, about their lack of impact. And so I've really been thinking a lot about how ethics and how ethicists can have greater impact on the technologies that scientists are developing and the scientists that we work with. Um, and so one of the things I've been thinking about doing, and I actually just got funding to do this on a, on a small scale, is to um, try and think about embedding ethicists in companies as neurotechnologies are developed. Um, so I have a project on that at the moment. That's one thing I'm really excited about. And I'm, I'm taking advantage of this time um, to actually, I'm going out to meet with Meta tomorrow. They're developing uh, a, a wrist-worn peripheral neural interface um, to think about embedding ethics um, in the development of that technology. Great. So I'm Brian Litt, and I'm a professor of neurology, neurosurgery, and bioengineering at Penn, where I've been for about 23 years. Um, I have a couple of different roles, that, and Penn is a unique place that's let me do this, where I'm 
tenured in engineering and I teach, uh, actually my course in brain computer interfaces is starting a week from now. It's a little smaller than this, but not much, but <laughs> this looks like a much friendlier course. <laughs> Um, and I ran the epilepsy center for about 11 years, actually presided over the surgery we heard about, um, but stepped down a year ago. My life's work has really been in devices and bringing new technologies into the clinical sphere from the laboratory and the basic science realms. So I spent quite a bit of time working on algorithms for a device now uh, by a company called Neuropace, which is in about 5,000 people um, nationwide that has our algorithms in it, and have really been focused on using these same techniques to work on other brain network disorders. Um, great example, we have a, a new hire coming, Lauren Hammer, you can raise your hand. He was uh, coming to do the same in movement disorders and tremor dependent. We're really excited about that. Um, the question is, how can you really explore these networks in the brain? How can you pinpoint therapy in a minimally invasive fashion? And how can you make it affordable, accessible, and effective in a dynamic disorder where the brain is constantly changing, you poke it with stimulation and do this to it, and it will poke you back and react in a very different way. So the things that I'm passionate about are a couple. One is training the next generation of leaders in this space, and the administration of the university seven years ago allowed us to start something called Penn Health Tech that you'll hear a little bit more about, where we actually focus on uniting all of these disparate forces in the wonderful compact footprint of Penn to bring new technologies forward to help people. And on working on next generation devices to be more effective, um, I have an exciting project I'm working on now that allows your implants to talk to you. And it's right now we're focusing on brain, but it could be other devices as well, so that your device may say, your probability of seizure just went up by 60%. What did you do? Well, I took a new antibiotic or I had a beer. Well, I wouldn't do that. I'll stimulate and try to control it for now and warn you if things get worse. Or I'm going to take a walk with my grandchild, adjust my brain stimulator for Parkinson's so that my gait is better and I don't need to worry about my tremors. Or maybe I want to write a letter home to an old friend make my hands steady, and I don't need to worry about my gait at this time. So I think that the new generation of using these technologies to make more effective, affordable um, devices is something I'm super excited about. We can get into it a little bit more as the conversation goes on. Well, thank, thank you all. And uh, thank Brian uh, to, to pick up on some of the uh, the comments that were made in, in the introductions that the uh, neuroscience is, is truly and, and neurotechnology development, I think, is, is truly dependent on interdisciplinary collaboration. And, and we've seen this at, at Penn in, in many disciplines that, again, the researchers from different departments, different expertise areas come together and bring their and impart that expertise in terms of, of new technology development. And again, I think nowhere is that more evident than neurotechnology development. I was wondering if you could uh, cite a few examples from your, your vast experience at, at Penn where uh, you, you've, you've seen this happen and, and been part of it in, in uh, real time. No, sure. So I'll give you three quick little vignettes, but just tell you about what about Penn makes it a unique place for doing this kind of work. The first thing is that the footprint is pretty small so that the major players with all the components that it takes to build new neurotechnologies are within just a few blocks of each other. For example, new material science fabrication sits only a couple of blocks from the major hospitals that are HUP, the main Penn Hospital, and CHOP, the children's hospital across the street. The vet school with large animal models and the Smilo laboratories that have large animal models to test these devices and new materials are right across the street from the hospital where they can be ported in and tested on humans. And then there is 
the ecosystem of over 160 faculty that do neuro based research, basic science as well as translational science. And they're dispersed among departments all over the university, psychology, ethics, bioengineering, chemical engineering, computer science. And so it's this really rich atmosphere. So two examples, Penn Health Tech was formed about seven years ago to make it really turnkey for people with ideas, both inside in the faculty and staff, students and outside to develop new things. So there was a need with this bustling environment in gene therapy. And I don't know, is Jim, Jim Wilson, are you here? Jim, I thought I saw him here, but anyhow, I wanted to acknowledge him. Got together some of the leaders who had a problem. They wanted to target gene therapy experiments and therapies for a variety of neuro disorders but didn't have easy ways of delivering therapy. So Health Tech got together a salon where we brought in engineers, radiologists, neurosurgeons, material scientists. The problem was presented by the clinicians and what developed were two efforts um, that have actually become commercialized. One of them was to develop a multi, a single port, multi-target delivery therapy for delivering gene therapy project th uh, product through a single burr hole. And that's now being tested by several large gene therapy companies that are under development. The second is an endoscopic approach to deliver through the foramen magnum through essentially a puncture of the spinal space in the neck to be able to endoscopically deliver the gene product to the right target. Those required all of those collaborations from people around in this tight space on campus to work together. And Penn Health Tech put in seed funding of about 50,000 for each project with management of the projects, which made them come to fruition. So that's example number one. Ideas, clinical needs that are unmet or new engineering technologies that can be brought forward. The second was a startup company needed help with a low field MRI to develop new techniques to improve the images. So we got together a group of faculty from computer science, from image processing, from radiology, to work together on new methods to enhance those images using adversarial, generalized adversarial networks or GANs. And that resulted in a several publications and new technology that the company can license to move that forward. The third one reflects a collaboration in informatics and computer science, and Penn now has a new building that's about to open up that's for machine learning, medical informatics, and AI, and has a major collaboration service with the School of Medicine and the rest of campus. And the idea was to take output from neuro devices to be able to dramatically improve their closed loop control. That required setting up a data platform that's open source that sits within Penn, but secure behind the firewall, pipes to get data from the new hospital to the engineers to develop algorithms and to move that forward. So it's an example of how using this entity, health tech, to unite the different players across campus in a way to leverage all of these facilities can really dramatically improve the pace of therapy. And what's interesting is that all of the groups that were managed under this program said that the money wasn't the most important thing. It was the project management and experience from materials, data science, regulatory affairs, the potential to do IDEs on campus that really allowed these projects to move forward. So those are three examples for each. Mike, you have a, uh, a startup uh, called Nia Therapeutics that's developing an implantable uh, uh, brain stimulation device. Could you tell us a little bit about the process, uh, the basic research in your lab that kind of underlies that company and, and the process of, of forming the startup? Sure. Um, I'll try to be brief. Uh, it, it's been an interesting adventure doing that. It actually started many years ago when I don't know if you remember this, Brian. I didn't warn you that I was going to bring up this story. When I first came to Penn, uh, uh, Brian um, uh, took me to the EMU, and we were talking about how to stimulate a patient's brain in the epilepsy monitoring unit. 
And I had just come from Boston where we did things a certain way and Brian did things a slightly different way and other people at other hospitals did brain stimulation in different ways. And uh, there've been mixed results about using brain stimulation therapeutically for memory restoration. Uh, I should say mixed results. Most of the results were that stimulating the brain makes memory worse. So the use of stimulation was to try to disrupt memory so that when you did a resection of the brain tissue, you wouldn't cause um, memory loss because you could stimulate the brain temporarily, cause memory to be worse, then stop stimulating, and then you would know not to stimulate that area. But every once in a while, there'd be this weird thing where the patient actually remembered better. We never knew why, and th there was no control. So back in 2013, um, it was actually an, an interaction I had with uh, an undergraduate student of mine, uh, Jeffrey Greenberg, and uh, a graduate student of mine, John Burke. We were at a conference and we said, you know, maybe there'd be a way to do a very large scale study of brain stimulation across many centers. And as it turned out, DARPA, uh, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, was looking for projects to do this type of work. We put together a team, and as, as Brian was mentioning, the team, you know, a team like this needs to have engineers, basic scientists, neurologists, neurosurgeons, neuroradiologists, um, et cetera. We didn't have an ethicist then, but later we involved one. Um, and we, we did this four-year study where we collected the world's largest data set on memory and brain stimulation from about 400 patients. These studies were typically published with three patients, four patients, six patients. Uh, so we studied a huge number of patients. So we learned, um, uh, we learned many interesting things. And I won't go through all of the, the scientific insights that came from that work, except to say that the, um, uh, at a certain point in the project, it became clear that we had figured out some of the key ingredients to how to improve memory. Um, the most important, just to be, to, to share one piece of that, uh, the most important ingredient was to know exactly when to stimulate the brain. You also need to know where and how to stimulate the brain, but let's just talk about when, because the when part is, is, is easy for me to explain. You need to stimulate the brain when you know that somebody is about to dip from a normal level of memory function into a poor level of memory function. That's when you need to stimulate it. So we figured out that you could use machine learning to track memory in real time and then trigger the stimulator. So the brain of a particular patient would tell the stimulator when to stimulate. You could also have it tell the stimulator where and how to stimulate. It's another part of the story, but you could tell it when to stimulate. And that, that formula is gonna be different for each patient. It's not gonna be the same. Each patient is gonna have a personalized formula for how the stimulator should stimulate the brain. Uh, and when we did these studies, we published these studies, we showed that we could reliably improve memory uh, by about 20%, which is about a half a standard deviation, which is usually the MCID, uh, the minimal clinically important difference criterion. Um, and so then uh, we um, patented, we, we uh, uh, patented some of the core ideas there, and we spun out a company um, and uh, yeah, and so right now the company, so the, the key challenge for the company was to take this huge apparatus, which involved multiple computers and recording and stimulating things and turn it into something that's maybe uh, a little bit larger, well, a little bit larger than my watch. Uh, and that took uh, five years and about um, $12 million and we did it and the device works and it's in sheep right now and and now we're doing all the fda required um uh, uh testing of the device the safety testing so that we could start a human trial hopefully next year thank you and anna uh the, the question of medical ethics is, is obviously a, a very uh relevant one in, in, in any translational uh science endeavor but it's unique issues emerge when we think about neurotechnologies. These are technologies that really have uh, the, the ability to change fundamentally who we are as, as, as people, uh, again, or, or, again, or, or also uh, 
or are designed to to treat individuals who might have uh, significant cognitive impairment at the time they're being consented. So what, what are issues that Penn is considering or, or that you would consider as a neuroethicist, uh, again, when, when thinking about how to in, engage uh, on, on these type of issues? Yeah, so there's a lot of really interesting issues that come up uh, in the neuroscience context. So uh, two are ones that you just mentioned. So one is thinking about informed consent um, in the context of these trials, right? So you're often working with patients who may have impaired capacity to consent um, or may have um, cognitive impairment of some sort, uh, uh, individuals dealing and patients dealing with neurodegenerative diseases and things like that. So uh, one of the things that I do, I work with investigators to develop um, ways to assess their capacity, right? So to understand whether um, the patient actually uh, understands the study that they're getting into or study that they're participating in. For example, this could be a, a you know, a first in human trial of a new uh, kind of stimulation. Um, and so in those cases, it's really important to, to really make sure that they're, uh, the, the patient has capacity to consent, that they really understand um, the, the contours of the study as well as the long-term implications of the study. Um, the other issue that, that you, I think, were, were hinting at there was that, um, you know, there, there can be other issues that come up when you think about the brain as opposed to other organs. Um, so one thing that we as ethicists think about, right, is, is risk. And risk in other medical contexts is really typically only thought of as safety or physical adverse events. But when you start to get into the brain and, and stimulating the brain, you can see other issues or, or other effects start to emerge, like changes to identity or changes to personality, right? So there's other sorts of risks that can move beyond those that are just these sort of physical um, adverse events. So that's another thing. Um, that we think about. Um, one of the sort of hottest topics in neuroethics right now is related to what we call post-trial obligations. And this is specifically related to um, what happens when you uh, implant uh, a patient with uh, a device. So this is for implanted devices, right? So typically, you know, a study will last maybe a few years, um, but the patient can be implanted for much longer than that, right? And, and so the idea when you're um, implanting a patient with a new experimental device, right? The ideal pathway is that there's the implantation, right? Maybe it's a new kind of stimulation to treat um, a, a specific clinical indication. The ideal pathway is that the implant works, the new device works, right? It gains FDA approval, and then the patient transitions from this experimental device to a device that has FDA approval, right? But reality doesn't, it doesn't always happen that way. So you can have a patient who benefits from the device, but the trial itself fails, and the patient maybe wants to keep that ongoing stimulation, right? So maybe it could be something like depression where this is the one thing that has helped them. And so figuring out how to support that patient to you know, maintain that stimulation or maintain the therapy, even though the trial has failed and the device you know, isn't, is not gonna end up going through FDA approval, you know, that's one major consideration. Um, another consideration is, you know, let's say the, the trial works, but maybe doesn't work for that patient. Um, and the patient elects not to have the device explanted. Um, usually at the end of the trial, the patient will explant the device, but in some cases, the patient will elect to keep the device. Um, and there can be issues when you get into you know, compatibility with, with MRI. So there's some, there's, there can be support that the patient needs down the line um, in, in terms of you know, uh, support from investigators or from the company. There's also been press um, about a comp right. You can have a device where actually the company goes bust, right? The company creates the device, implants the patient, but then the company itself um, fails. So there's all these issues, right, that extend beyond sort of the five year or or several year study mark that that can affect the patient. So it's really important to think about a long term plan in the early stages of when a company or an investigator um, is is starting up with a device and and. You know, that's something that I don't think was given enough attention maybe 10, 15, 20 years ago. It's starting to get more attention. And so one of the things that I do with investigators is work and then help advise them on building a long-term plan from the early stages. Um, and I'll just share one other thing that I, I, I work on with, with companies and, and investigators is thinking about patient um, engagement and really involving the patient groups at, at an early stage so that their lived experience and that their needs inform the development of that device. And there, that's another thing that I think has been a bit late um, to hit the neurotech space, at least in the fields where, where I work in the most. Um, but it's one thing, it's something that's really, really important. And it's not always um, straightforward or easy in terms of thinking about how to do that and, and how to ensure that the patient group or the patient representatives 
that the, that the feedback that they're giving and that the input that they're giving actually feeds back into the design of the study, into the implementation of the study, um, and things like that. And so I work with uh, investigators to make sure that there is a really solid patient engagement plan and that it's not just there, but that it's it's there's a constant feedback between the patient groups um, and the investigators as they're carrying out the study. I'll throw this out to the whole, the whole panel. There, there's been a uh, uh, obviously a revolution in, in artificial intelligence, a rapid advancement over the last uh, five years, and and in terms of the power and the uh, capabilities of these technologies, obviously. Uh, in integrating them into to neuro technologies is, is something that that is is obviously being done, being considered. Just wondering what what Penn is doing and thinking about in terms of the opportunity for AI integration with neurotechnology, but also some of the challenges uh, that are that need to be managed as, as part of this process. So, I mean, I could make some comments. So, it, it's an area of intense interest right now, and the FDA is really very carefully scrutinizing algorithms for implantables. We've done some experiments where we've actually taken data from the implantables. We did this in dogs first in a collaborative grant with Mayo with epilepsy, taken data from the devices up to the cloud, had algorithms that learn retrain themselves and put them back into the animal without any human intervention. When you think about that, that's actually kind of a dicey thing, right? Because as the algorithms are changing stimulation parameters that could potentially have an effect on memory, behavior, personality, sensory experiences, depending upon where they are in the brain, there have to be very careful guardrails in terms of what the device and the algorithms can do and what their effects on the human are. So I think these things are being approached in a very careful fashion. And right now there aren't, to my knowledge, devices where these are allowed to roam free range. I think Penn is you know, very interested in experimenting with the use of transformer models, things like chat. And we actually are using for this experiment where the implantable is communicating with the patient, we're using transformer models and we have our own isolated behind the firewall version of chat that runs on an Azure cloud in the medical institution that we're starting to deploy in some of these interactions. But I think it's really early days. And Michael, how are you guys dealing with this? Well, yeah, I, I agree with uh, I agree with everything Brian said. I'm I'm focused on a pretty narrow space of using machine learning in a very specific problem domain. In in my case, you have a set of parameters. There's like four or five parameters where you can say where we know the ranges of those parameters that are safe for neuromodulation. Uh, so we know that we're going to stimulate below a certain amplitude within a certain range of frequencies. Um, in certain locations, right? So we have this space of parameters. And normally, you might tune your device, maybe even clinically like you would for a device for Parkinson's, uh, with, you know, moving around in, those pra in that parameter space. Um, given that that parameter space is deemed safe, if you want to optimally choose the parameter for a given patient, why not use all the data you could possibly gather to get the best possible answer for a particular patient, right? It would seem strange not to do that. So what we do is we build models that predict memory, and that's where the machine learning comes in. So we have good days and bad days. We have good moments and bad moments. At this moment, you may be focused on exactly what I'm saying, or you may be thinking about whatever else uh, is on your mind, and, and you, your memory might be better or worse than it normally is, and we can track that. All you need is a whole bunch of electrodes in the brain and uh, a whole bunch of data. So you collect data on memory, you record all these channels, and then you build a statistical model that maps between the brain data and the memory performance. And the more data, I mean, my, my short point about uh, the machine learning is you really need outstanding data if you want to build a good machine learning model. It's more, it's more about the data. So you collect tons and tons of data, 
And then you use the data to build the model and the model predicts the future and you check it, you cross validate it. And now you have a readout of memory function. Like you could imagine if you didn't have a brain stimulator, you just imagine that your watch or your phone tells you how good is your memory at this moment. That's a pretty neat technology. Even if you didn't connect that to a stimulator, if you knew whether your memory was better or worse, maybe you could take a nap or have a coffee or go for a jog or whatever. So that's how we use, we use machine learning to build that model. And then once you have that model, you can then use that model in a closed loop to control the stimulator. You can tell the model to um, determine when the stimulator should stimulate, which I mentioned before. You could use the model to pick the optimal parameter for a given patient. You could say, well, instead of having to do a whole memory experiment each time, I can change the parameter of stimulation slightly and use the machine learning output to tell me whether the parameter was chosen to be better or worse than what I would have expected before. So that's a very basic use of machine learning. Um, and in the case of memory, it forecasts how good your memory would be. Uh, I don't know that that exists yet for, say, depression, but you could imagine it would tell you whether a person's mood is good or bad. Uh, Brian, you worry about predicting what's your probability of a seizure in the next moment, right? Yeah, so I, I would say that we have these same sorts of applications. A point that Michael made, I think, is really, really important to emphasize and something that's not done now. If you go to have an epilepsy surgery or a Parkinson's device put in or something for obsessive compulsive disorder, maybe someday schizophrenia, nowadays clinical trials for depression, very often... The therapy you get is based upon the experience of your clinician, the experience of the center, and some individualized component uh, of your physician reacting to you and their interpretation of the medical literature, which is usually relatively small series of cases unless there are huge clinical trials. But the era of being able to accumulate these data provide us the opportunity to compare each individual against thousands of other patients. Like if I were going to have epilepsy surgery and I had electrodes put in my brain, I'd like to know what worked in the, in the last 500 people who were like me, as opposed to just reading a case report of 30 patients published from a single center. So I think you're going to see a huge opportunity for change in leveraging these informatics. The other thing I would say on a different topic is there are lots of tremendous opportunities to change this field. Implantable electrodes for these stimulation devices like Michael's and mine and others, platinum, platinum meridian, expensive conflict metals, thousands of dollars, maybe a couple of K for a single electrode. There's new research on, on materials like Maxine, for example, which are dirt cheap, sprayable, they can be put as an ink, and they may, you know, eventually these or other materials may replace these sorts of metals. So I think leveraging new materials and also the devices, Michael, I don't know who makes your IPG, your, your device is actually quite dif different because of its custom nature and its, interpret and its computational capabilities, but a lot of the devices that are made for implantables are kind of commoditized. They're made by a few major manufacturers who make them for a number of different companies. So ideally, we'll be seeing more generalized sets of electrodes, materials, implantables to make these things more affordable. They shouldn't cost 35K to 50K for just the box alone and 100K for the implant. <laughs> So there's uh, also been a lot of discussion recently and, and, and uh, some controversy about providing equitable access and ensuring equitable access to the trials, new devices, new technologies as they're uh, developed and, and, and ultimately commercialized. Just wondering what, what Penn is thinking in terms of ensuring that uh, there, there's equitable access uh, made available for uh, Again, new, new neurotechnologies that are being developed. And uh, maybe, Anna, you can, can start this discussion. Well, I think, Brian, you're, I mean, so I'll say, and then I'll throw it to Brian, because you're actually actively working on 
doing the equitable access. I just think about the equitable access. But I, I think one of the challenges with uh, with neurotechnology is that um, you know some of it is very bespoke, especially a lot of the things that you're hearing about in the media regarding brain computer interfaces, right? Trained on a single individual, um, extraordinarily expensive, and and really the challenge is figuring out. Um, you know, how to get reimbursements for those costs and, and how to move beyond that single individual um, to really making it something that a lot of people um, can have access to, that it's not just so prohibitively expensive for one person, but you are actually working practically to, to address this. I, I think it's really important to step back and realize that more than half of the world doesn't have access to an MRI machine. You know, there are a number of low field MRI companies um, that are working on these and the images aren't quite as good as the $7,000 your insurance may reimburse like $750 for a scan that these three Tesla um, scanners put out. But if you could buy a $50,000 scanner instead of a million dollar one that plugs into the wall that you could put into a place that doesn't have MRI, Incredibly useful. EEG, just to get the electrodes on the head to diagnose epilepsy, is not available in almost half the world. So there are people, Flavia Vitali at our institution and others, Tim Dennison's group at Oxford, are working on cheap electrode headbands that you could put on, connect to your iPhone, and transmit an EEG to somebody who could read it. And that that could be done for under $100. And I think that the question is, you know, does our venture model work for these very low profit but highly, you know, useful devices? How do we get those things out? I don't know, Michael, what's the future of memory stimulation in the low-income world? I mean, I guess they're bigger problems, but dementia is a huge problem. There, no, right? I, I guess... This is, this is not a problem I've thought about very much, but in thinking about it, what I can share is so that the actual cost of building a new class three medical device, the actual like, I mean, the manufacturing cost is not that great. I mean, my guess is that it's similar to a hearing aid. It's not cheap, but it's not that expensive. It's the cost of the research and development to get from the lab, like my lab, to actually building a device, because it's not only the whatever, however many millions of dollars that went into at least 10 million to the, to like you were talking about, I designed my own IPG. I was an idiot to think I could do that. Somehow I got lucky and I was able to make it work. But if I knew how hard it was going to be, there's no way I would have, uh, I would have tried, but I, I somehow made it. Um, but the the real challenge, I think, is that there's there's not resources to do that sort of thing because it's such a long horizon. And I think the venture model um, is penalizes projects that have a very, very long horizon like that. That's now here I am, uh, you know, I'm not a I'm not a finance person, um, but I think it's you know if you're if you're looking at a at a ten year horizon. I mean, it took us how many years? It took us five years to build just to get the device in the first to get the first working version of a device into the animal. We had a version that didn't quite work a year and a half ago, um, but now it does everything it's supposed to do. But it took uh, it took five years, um, and so investors had to be very patient. And in in our case, uh, I was happy that I found people who believed in what I was doing. Uh, but that I think I think if there was a larger ecosystem of investment in new device technologies, the actual devices themselves are not that expensive to build. It's just you have to you have to give people there there is a scale to this thing, and you have and, to give people returns on their investments. And we we haven't mentioned, but I I think most of you know that this sector, the you know treatments for neurological conditions be they peripheral we haven't even talked about bioelectronic devices for the peripheral nervous system but it is one of the most rapidly growing needs in terms of the health of our community worldwide people are living longer and accumulating more of these disorders i have no doubt the electrodes are getting better our computational ability is getting better. Batteries are getting better. 
the costs will come down. It's a highly fruitful area. And I think that all of these areas and different disorders, what Lauren works on, what Michael works on, what I work on, epilepsy movement disorders, psychiatric disorders, they all benefit from the knowledge of each other because they're all brain network disorders. And they all present the same dilemmas to Anna. And I think as we've gotten to know her, need to use her more like, when do we take that leap if there isn't a good animal model to putting that new stimulation device in a human for the first time? Or when do we actually do an ablation in the scanner with local mapping rather than recording somebody for weeks at a time? I do think we can learn a lot from what, what the trajectory of cardiac devices has been. Mm -hmm. And pacers are now the standard of care. Defibrillators, the standard of care for many conditions. And I think you're gonna see that in our space too. So get your questions ready. I, I have one more question for the panel before we'll, we uh, transition over to the, the audience Q and A session. And uh, that's looking into your, uh, into the crystal ball a little bit. Over the next five to 10 years, what do you see as the most impactful advance uh, in, in neuroscience technology development? And what is the biggest challenge that lies ahead? Well, let me uh, let me try and tackle what I think is going to be the the most impactful advance. Once we have devices recording multi-channel data from the human brain, in we don't need it in a million people. There are millions who need such devices. But let's just say there were these devices in Brian. You mentioned five thousand, at least five thousand neuropace patients, but those data. Um, uh, are pretty limited in scale, just for context. Once we have data from hundreds of electrodes in thousands of people, the data exhaust combined with all the other measurements and, and clinical data is going to answer questions that we can't even imagine answering right now, right? Because, I mean, I'll, let, let me actually say something a little radical. If the project of creating neural interfaces is even modestly successful, the 25-year research program of my lab will be done and will be in a new phase, meaning all the ways that we've collected data in my laboratory and hundreds and hundreds of other laboratories will be completely obsolete because these devices in people, maybe in this, maybe in five years from now, there will be 10 people in this room who have devices streaming their data to the cloud. And those data will answer clinical questions that we can't even imagine answering right now because those data don't exist. I could, I could speak to that. So, um, you know, thinking about what an exciting time this is to be in neurotech, over the last two years, I would say, at, at, you know, I've, I've started asking neuroscientists at the conference I've go to, we'll see a presentation. It's an incredible presentation showing an advance that wasn't possible years before. And never have I heard more neuroscientists say, this is something I've never thought would be possible in my lifetime. Really in the last 18 months to two years, I've heard it so many times that I, I've actually just gotten in the habit of asking, going and asking neuroscientists if, you know, what they think. And it, I mean, these are people who've been in the field, like leaders in the field, right, who are saying this and really only in the last 18 months um, or two years. Um, and a lot of it, not all of it, but is around brain computer interfaces, neural interfaces, the capabilities of recording. Um, and we're seeing a lot more media attention to neurotech. We haven't mentioned that here, we haven't really talked about that, but there's a, a tremendous amount of private um, investment now in neurotech, right? Um, Elon Musk, Neuralink, right? That's really brought things to the mainstream, but also companies like Synchron, uh, Paradromics, these other BCI companies. Um, that's really exciting, right? The, 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 the magnitude of funding, I think, I mean, it's just, it's so, so far past what academics um, typically work with, uh, you know, so there, there's so much, there, there's so many advances that are being made and it's a really exciting time to be in the neurotech space. Um, in terms of the challenges, one of the things, one of the questions as an ethicist that I get asked a lot is related to Neuralink and Elon Musk, because uh, Elon Musk has stated that, uh, you know, the goal, right, the, his, his ultimate goal with the relation to Neuralink um, is to develop a consumer device a device that anybody can use, that a healthy patient can use. They're not going that way to start with. They're going the medical device route first. 
Um, but it'll be interesting to see, right? If they are successful, I don't know if they will be, if they are successful, are they going to try to transition this um, into healthy individuals? Um, so I don't know what will happen with that. I don't know if they'll even be successful with the medical device route. I, I mean, I, I hope they are. Um, but the questions really loom is, you know, if they are, right, then what's next after that? So I think the most exciting thing for me, you know, is the fact that at the same time as these technologies are improving, our knowledge of the basic science is improving. So that these devices will continue to get better and we'll see milestones. Like right now for epilepsy devices, we have about, the average patient gets about a 70% reduction in their seizures. These are people who could not be controlled at all by medicine in the past. I think they'll continue to improve. I think devices for tremor, for OCD, for addiction, for depression, will all improve. And yes, we'll be spending a lot on these devices, but similar to the cardiac world, we'll see these filter down and over time give access and improvement and improved quality of life to people who didn't have access to these before becomes they'll become affordable. I don't think the technological and scientific barriers are the biggest problem. I think the biggest challenge is political. And it has to do with data. Right now, I have two large grants to try to amass data from multiple institutions to build this kind of atlas to compare a new patient to hundreds or thousands of other patients. Medical centers don't want to give these data up because of fear of security and privacy. There are companies like Flatiron that have monetized data from institutions like ours, and the institutions were really brute because they see an opportunity to monetize it. And so the opportunity to really leverage all of this is locked behind these political barriers. Our group and others are trying to build, you know, maybe the answer is some kind of public-private partnership where each of the institutions that owns the data is a shareholder in a platform that runs behind the firewall federated at its institution so that Michael can get his data from each institution to better train his algorithms and I can get it for epilepsy and all of that. But these models don't exist so easily. So I think we have a lot of work to do in that space. The government's gonna have to legislate it and enforce it in some way and it might have to do with changing the nature of our health system as well. And patients may need to deal with a little bit more privacy risk, you know, like in other countries, like in the U.S. I don't know. Well, th I want to thank all of our panelists for a very insightful uh, discussion. I, I certainly learned a lot today, and I hope uh, you and the audience also uh, saw it the same way. And, and we'll open uh, the the session now for uh, questions from the audience. And uh, for, for this session, uh, again, we'll, we'll keep it short. Uh, we'll take a few questions. Please state your name, uh, your, your company affiliation, the sentence in, or one, one sentence, again, articulating the question, and the panelists, uh, again, you're, you're directing the question to, and we can get through more questions in that way. So uh, each of you should have microphones at your uh, desk. If if uh, you have a question, you can turn the microphone on and and uh, and start now. Uh, hi there. Thank you for a wonderful session. Uh, my name is Naveen Rao. I'm here writing for Forbes. Uh, you mentioned the press is picking up on this yet, but uh, here uh, I just want to keep the conversation going on the neuroethics front really quick. What is the future of neuroethics outside of the academic environment? You mentioned working with startups directly. I hope your meeting with Meta tomorrow goes really well. Uh, but just a few years down the line, what does this look like? And what about accountability, governance, self-oversight? Like, what do you hope it looks like? It's a great question. Um, so I hope that the conversation and, and the efforts that have now that we're now seeing in the academic space, where, for example, I'm embedded with teams of scientists and I work with scientists directly um, on their teams. And I'm, I'm, I do that at Penn. I, I also work externally on NIH projects, on DARPA projects. 
I hope that there's a way that that can move um, to companies that are developing neurotechnology. So exactly like you said, I hope that we can, and it's not a, it's not so easy to to replicate this, right? Um, when you have an in, what's called an embedded ethics embedded ethicist within academia, you generally have sort of an open door. Like I could go and hang out with neurologists and neurosurgeons and talk to them, and it's open and free. But what I've heard talking to neurotechnology companies um, is it's not an open door. The companies want to know what their risk, right? It's risky for them to open their door to an ethicist. And they also want to know, and, and rightfully so, that they can get some value out of the interaction. And so part of what I've been doing is thinking about how to transfer this model of embedded ethics that seems to have worked in academia to the corporate sector, right? What value is there for the companies to include ethicists? Um, but also how can ethicists also benefit, right? How, how can we take the knowledge learned um, you know, by being an embedded ethicist at a company and actually benefit the larger, the larger ethics audience in some way. So moving beyond just an ethics consultant model, which just benefits one that one company, and it's usually very private, but thinking about how that knowledge can benefit others as well. So I hope what we'll see um, is further work to have embedded ethicists at different companies and for companies to actually engage with ethicists and talk more with ethicists. And I, I would say to the, to the credit of many neurotech companies, um, especially the ones in the BCI space um, that I, I've been involved with and speaking to, they seem to be really open to this. So I would say I'm, I'm, I'm pretty optimistic that this can happen. I think it's just finding the right format or the right, the right way to do it. Right. I'll just speak. Matt Mikowski, Telegraph Health Partners. I was intrigued, Dr. Lynn. Your comment about implants possibly having an impact on addiction, and given that Philadelphia and San Francisco have something in common, which is a massive addiction problem, what mm. allows you to, to see that that is actually curable or solvable with an implant? I'm just curious. Well, it's interesting. I mean, Anna can comment. There's Casey Halpern, who is a neurosurgeon at Penn, has a grant, you know, between Penn and Stanford to do implants for food addiction and actually is seeing signatures when patients are craving uh, food and want to binge where brain stimulation can turn that down. There's also a literature on brain stimulation and actually focal brain ablation in regions that control addiction. And some of it is a, you know, remember the, the literature and the history of using interventional neurosurgery to treat psychiatric disorders is a pretty checkered history. Um, but there are a series of patients, um, actually one, one series was published in China and it was shut down by the government where they actually did ablations on nucleus accumbens in patients who were addicted to narcotics and showed that they could ameliorate that. But in that case, it was something that was not done voluntarily. So I, I think there are brain stimulation experiments, reversible, non-lesional for food addiction. And uh, Michael, I think, didn't you do a study uh, or participate? There was a nature paper on addiction or gambling or what was that paper? Uh, we did some work on- Justin was on that. We, we did some work on reward, uh, on the neuro, neural signature of reward in the human brain. That's right, with Gordon Baltuck. Um, Kareem Zaglul was the first author in science. Um, so we certainly know a lot about the neural signatures in the human brain of all the reward circuitry and things that may underlie addiction. So you could imagine that you could build a closed loop system that would trigger stimulation to modulate, either um, decrease or increase the activation of, of neural ensembles that affect people's addictive, appetitive behaviors in some way. Yeah, and I, I think it's an active area, but again, it's really fraught with you know, ethical issues. And I think that's why Anne is involved in that study. And some people might say, well, how can you do brain stimulation for food addiction? You know, but if you actually look at the morbidity of some of these gastric bypass and stapling and sleeve procedures, the risks of those are probably much greater than putting in a single electrode for brain stimulation. So I think you're gonna see more of it. <laughs> one, one more question. 
Go ahead in the front. Yeah. Yes. Well, yeah. Um, hey, I'm Patrick uh, Hummingbird Ventures. Um, you guys have talked a lot about devices. Um, obviously, there's a very interesting theme also going on in small molecules in neuroscience and other biologics. You mentioned food addiction, of course, GLP ones are very interesting. I'm curious how um, med tech, these devices you're talking about, might intersect with that future. Oh. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I, I think there. are a couple of programs with devices that actually um, release drug on demand that are closed loop devices. There's one for epilepsy right now that does interventricular uh, installation of valproic acid. That's a company out of Australia. Um, and so I, I think you may very well see, I mean, certainly, and, and and then, so there are small molecules that are being injected, right, for treatment. There are hybrid devices that are part drug delivery, part reading and responsive devices. And then there's other work on nanoparticles that can be used to be instilled and then do remote stimulation to induce currents in them as well to have less invasive targeting. So I think you're going to see an increase in those kinds of hybrid sorts of delivery systems as well. You know, and you're seeing them in other parts of the body. Closed loop insulin pumps now are quite, you know, common. And what would prevent there from being an interactive component there? You know, nowadays they have a big meal, they adjust their pump, you know, but the device could potentially perceive that and respond on its own without interactions. Well, please join me in uh, thanking our panelists for their contributions today. It's a wonderful discussion. Um, thank you again to everyone for joining us. Um, I'll make this really quick, but um, First of all, yes, thank you again to all of you for traveling here to be with us. Um, what we're trying to do when we're hosting this program during JP Morgan is hopefully introduce you and help illustrate the quality of the science and innovation that's going on at Penn. I think when we started this eight years ago, we had Carl June and Jim Wilson out there with 20 people starting to talk about CAR T and cell and gene therapy. So we're we're really trying to um, you know create a more stakeholders around our work back in Philadelphia. Clearly, th there's a lot of amazing innovation going on in this space with um, you know a lot more to come. So um, we hope you'll take the time to come find us. PCI is lucky enough to partner with all of these faculty to help develop these ideas into technologies and startups that uh, clearly will and do have a huge social impact. So it's really amazing to be part of it. And I just wanted to highlight, we did, um, we have almost 30 startups actually who are raising capital. We have um, printouts of that um, available outside. All of this information is also on our website and feel free to contact any of us, um, Ben, Michael, Carter, all of us who are here if you would like introductions to any of the faculty or any of the startups that we work with. And um, before we sign off, I wanted to ask Dr. Catherine Doyle to come up, who's been, oh, uh, she um, is a partner at Saul Ewing, has been an amazing partner to us at Penn. She has, is a patent attorney, has her PhD, and um, thank you. I'm gonna make this really fast, because I know, Lori's. you're all in a hurry to, to leave, but I just wanna say it's an honor for Sol Ewing to sponsor this every year. Thank you very much. And it's also an honor for us to work with Penn, uh, because I've worked with Penn for a long time because I'm older than dirt, but um, it's been amazing to watch Penn just become a leader in so many different fields and especially in neuroscience. So thank you very much to the panel. Thank you very much to PCI, particularly to Jim, Laurie, and to Ben. And uh, I hope you all have a wonderful JP Morgan going forward. And uh, I think there might be still some stuff out there. So have a good evening. <laughs>